Thanks, Jenny. Hello and welcome. <laughs> Good to see everybody today. We're gonna to give people time to get settled in and sorted. As you know, if you've been to a Plexus uh, event like this before, we encourage you to be chatty. We encourage you to pass notes in class, You know, have conversations, drop your contact information. You should walk out of here feeling better uplifted and more connected uh, for sure. So we're just gonna let people come on in. We'll probably get started in like five minutes or so. And I'm, you know what I'm so excited about? I made no slides for this. So can we just talk about not having to do a slide deck today? I just chose not to. <laughs> All right, good. We, we will let our words speak for ourselves and you will have to use your imagination <laughs> to picture what the slide would have been like and in theory, it'll be great. Going to manifest all the good stuff. I actually do have a slide deck that we'll share with you uh, that was shared with me from someone over at Overdrive, actually. A whole uh, Trans Day of Visibility uh, presentation slide. It's beautifully branded. It has some base level information in there. So you know what? Instead of recreating the wheel after the event uh, today, we'll make sure we share that out as a resource in case it gives you something to bring into your work at your organization. Okay. Of course, we are gonna be recording today. What we'll do is we're gonna put the um, screen right on the participants. So that's all that will be recorded. So no worries, you can keep your camera on so we can see your vibe and all that. That'll be great. Um, the, oh, what was the other thing I was gonna say? I totally forgot, oh, I lost it. Oh, well, it'll come back to me. Oh, I know what it is. Uh, you know, one of the things that we talk about is a great way for efficient communication is when we're in meetings and spaces like this is to go ahead and share our pronouns. So you don't have to, but if you're comfortable, it's always a great way, just like sharing your name to make sure that we're engaging in efficient and inclusive ways. So the way that you can do that is you can go over to the participant list. You can find your name there. And I think there's three dots and rename. So you're welcome to do that. Uh, you know, just a small little step and it's nice and easy to do on Zoom instead of Teams. Happy International Women's Day, right? Wow. And the most inclusive, uh, right? Women are women, trans women are women, right? Uh, I was, I had this really great day. I was on, um, we're part of a collaborative chamber alliance and I get to give the closing remarks. Uh, we had some phenomenal speakers uh, talking about being in manufacturing, um, uh, black women talking about being the first ever right doctor, the first ever judge, just really phenomenal, vulnerable, beautiful conversations. And I got to do my closing. And I said, one of the things that we're aware of at Plexus is the power of being one of many in a room instead of the one and only in a room, right? Um, so there's this really funny moment, uh, the judge who was there I'm spacing on her name, she came up to me afterwards and she said, I'm so glad that you mentioned that you were a lesbian. I have a spouse too. I am also a lesbian, but it was really beautiful. You know, what <laughs> we talked about though, was that um, the way that she moves through the world as people see her as a black woman. And so that is often what she's having to break down. That is often what she's having to celebrate or talk about that she sometimes can forget the fact uh, to also mention that she has a spouse. So it's just one of those ways in which we're all navigating all parts of our identity, right? It's complex and complicated and beautifully simple at the same time. So with that rambling that I just did on my 15th cup of coffee, uh, we're gonna go ahead and begin this conversation uh, with our employee resource group council. Uh, thank you all for being a part of this. Um, we are recording this today, but what I should say is we will let you know how we're sharing this. We're gonna check in here with our participants tomorrow just to make sure that how we feel um, about sharing it. So while we have it recorded, we'll have to let you know later if we're gonna go ahead and share that. So I'm gonna add some pins here so you can see our big old faces. Let me make sure I get everybody. Carly, where'd you go? There we go. Okay, all right, here we are. 
So it is International Women's Day. March also has Trans Day of Visibility as one more day and way that we can have awareness about uplifting voices that are marginalized lives and experiences that might be overlooked and making sure that we're making the circle bigger, right? Because we know that in the center, it is cis and it is white and it is straight, <laughs> it is male identified, uh, but that's not how circles work. They're fluid, they're ever expanding, they get bigger, they get smaller, right? Um, so today we're going to talk a bit about, you know, what is trans day of visibility? What's the importance of visibility? Hopefully from us in this conversation, you get some ideas for how you might want to host a TDOV event, uh, what resources and information you can share within your companies to make sure that you are elevating uh, the powerful and meaningful uh, leadership and voices of trans folks, right? But unfortunately, as we're going to be celebrating about visibility, we need to talk about some of the ridiculousness, right? We know that a lot of times in your ERGs, uh, especially LGBTQ ones, you might get pushback sometimes. It says things like, oh, we don't do politics or that's too political. And you're having to keep having the wedge to say, nah, this is about people. And some of our lives get politicized. So we just wanted to make sure we did a quick rundown on some of the stuff that's happening across the country um, with regards to anti-queer, anti-LGBTQ legislation, noting that within this, all of these bills that I'm talking about, they are specifically targeting gender, gender identity, and trans folks. Right? So even though they might be going after gay moms like me, they are making it extra hard and extra difficult, and they're really trying to limit people's access. So I'm gonna share this article with you all afterwards. I just got it from GLAD Law, right? So the issue of healthcare. Before 2020, no state had ever introduced legislation to ban healthcare for transgender Americans. So, all right, this is some new stuff that people are trying to do. It has been safely prescribed for decades, gender affirming care, access to healthcare, access to affirming and welcoming uh, providers, insurance, all this different stuff. Um, it's, it's supported by every major, major medical association and leading health authority. Uh, will you hear from some health practitioners that we do need more research and more understanding? Yes, but that's why we have to make the care available. That's why we have to collect data uh, is in order for us to know how things are working and what works best for different populations. This is how medical advancement and science happens all the time, nothing new to it. I think there's like some people having a lot of joy around me. So I'm sorry if that's distracting, but like, let's all just like love those sounds of joy if they're coming through. Drag performances. I don't think, uh, I think you all know now in a geography lesson uh, where Tennessee is because they definitely came after drag performances. When I see these bills that are coming off against drag, which is an art form that's been performed for centuries across cultures, across time with all different kinds of nuances, um, what really comes to mind for me is an American context around the lavender scare, around around, around the three piece uh, article rule where like somebody like my wife, Erin, would have been arrested for wearing those men's jeans and that, you know, that t-shirt and that hat, right? So there's all these different ways and older laws and legislation that have policed people's bodies and expression of gender. So this is some old stuff coming in and focused on drag but it's specifically concerning to me for the way in which it makes um, trans folks specifically um, in, in danger. Okay. So, sorry, how's my, how's the sound coming through? Is the bleed too much or is it okay? Okay, it's good, great. Um, so censorship and education, um, I just heard Hannah, um, I'm sorry, I'm a little bit, Jones from uh, 1619 Project talk about a free society does not ban books. <laughs> Right, so censorship and education is something that in American free society we've come up against a lot. Uh, what we're seeing is these are really long ago reminiscent of legislation like Proposition 8, back when Harvey Milk was leading in San Francisco, which seeks to take LGBTQ folks out of working with children because it is uh, the misinformation that there's something wrong with us, that we're obscene, that we're grooming, right? And then it's also trying to control information. So it's gonna be making it really difficult to be talking about our histories, even just to be able to respond to my kids about having two moms, let alone the fact that a lot of these bills go even further and they make it punitive. Uh, they make it so people will lose their license if they support gender queer, gender non-binary and trans kids, right? And that's like our job. Our job is to support kids, not hurt kids, right? 
So that's what we see when we're talking about censorship and education. And then of course, uh, transgender student participation in school sports. So the beautiful thing around visibility and, and around trans folks being like, hey, yeah, I'm here and I'm swimming and I'm playing golf and I'm doing sports, like I'm living my life, um, is that it has now made this uh, a wedge issue with state legislators to target these young people. There is no proof of any of this. What we have going on here in Ohio is we have one out trans high school student playing softball, right? And by her own admission, she's like, I'm not so good, right? <laughs> but I love softball and I just want to play. Uh, so not only are they just like totally harming this one person and her family, they're just creating a lot of uh, false claims, a lack of information, nothing that is scientifically proven. So and also, if I can just real quick on the Ohio sports ban, I think it's worth noting too that the Ohio High School Athletic Association already has what I think is a fairly decent compromise on trans participation in sports at the high school level. You either have to be a year on hormone replacement therapy or HRT, or you have to go in front of a board and they have to decide that you are not any kind of safety risk or any sort of risk at being an unfair competitor in the sport you're playing. So yeah. there, it isn't either unchecked, it has a requirement of, and a like a fail safe in it, and that still isn't enough. And it is keep like that it is clearly effective in terms of they're only such a small handful. I think there's like three other people in this upcoming this school year since um Ember. Which you. if you haven't seen the video put out on her, it's very well worth your time and get some tissues ready. That's perfect. Sean, I appreciate you jumping in because we're gonna sure. segue over and Carly, you've been activating this chat, leading by great example of passing notes and putting it down there. Did you want to pop on in here before we move over into our other kind of questions and also have you all introduce yourselves? You had a great information in here. Well no pretty much the the information that I that I put placed in the chat, I encourage everyone to read the read the Mother Jones article. That okay. just came out today. Great. And not only are you, not only did you have a hearing today in Ohio, you had the first federal hearings on legislation designed to discriminate against transgender Americans. Let's, uh, let's talk about what this is really about. We are talking about discrimination against Americans. Haven't we been to this party as a nation and as a people before? Mm -hmm. We have more than once in the more than in the nearly 250 year history of this republic. We've been here before. And now we're here in the most naked, most blatant, most premeditated, coordinated way possible. A, a small group of, I'm going to call them that anti-trans character assassin, assassins based on the beltway, right-wing groups. Yes, I know one thing, by the way, name's Carly Chardonnay Webb. Um, I'm a journalist as, and I'm an activist. My pronouns are she, her. And when I'm not on a when I'm not on my podcast, the transporter room, mixing it up with Shauna Atkinson, talking about some football, I'm also a staff operator and training coordinator for Trans Lifeline. That is North America's only 24-hour day, seven-day hotline that has been built by transgender people, 100% manned by transgender people, with the effort, especially right now, of keeping transgender people, not only in North America, but around the world alive through attacks. This is not through the attacks that we're seeing, not just in this country, but globally. And yes, it's easy to pick on the Middle East, China, Russia, but some of the worst anti-LGBTQ laws in the world are in nations in the European Union, members of NATO, the United Kingdom, and what we're seeing with 49, 429 pieces of legislation in 41 states here in the United States. Um, I just wanna give a quick antidote to understand the level of where we're at right now. My grandfather played semi-pro baseball as a young man. And his semi-pro baseball team at times had to play in the Jim Crow South. Now, my grandfather and his friends grew up in Omaha, Nebraska. That's where I'm originally from. I live in Connecticut now. They had to carry a little thing called the Green Book. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm pretty sure if you're Black in this room, you know what a Green Book is. My grandfather gave me one of his copies of the Green Book. Now, 
That was back in the ni- late 1940s, early 1950s. Now let's now let's fast forward to 2023. Right now, there are bathroom bills against transgender Americans being prescribed in 24 states, including my home state of Nebraska. And it looks like, unfortunately, it will pass. Now, think about what that would mean for me to go to drive home from Connecticut to Nebraska to visit my family. My family reunions this summer. I may need a green book to travel in my own country in the 21st century. Let that sink in, good people. Right. We are going with these laws. Oh, when they say, oh, we want to take America back. Oh, they're not talking about possession. They're also talking about direction. The question to ask yourself, even as we're having this discussion is, do you want to go back? Right. Every American needs to ask that question. Right. And so the beautiful thing here to level set to, and thank you, Carly, for coming in. Thanks for dropping that information because I had not yet seen that, is the thing that we're going to do when we share these links that everyone's dropping in the chat. And one of the things that can be beneficial about GLAD Law and other resources, this one that I'm going to share over is specifically a reporting guideline. So for you as ERG leaders, how do you share these facts? How do you make sure they're clear and consistent? How do you help make a case? When you're looking at reporting and journalism, that's really what it's about, right? It's about creating clear, concise facts, and then also reporting on it in an equitable, uh, inclusive, and proper way. So we're going to share this over because what we want you to do is make sure that you find ways that you can talk about these really difficult subjects clearly, right? And try to avoid some of these ways in which people are going to throw some political potholes at you because that's just not the case. Um, So back over here to trans data visibility and what we're going to be talking about. Um, what I'm excited about our panelists being here today is not only is Shauna my colleague at Plexus, but I've seen her on a number of panels just discussing the power of sport, right? The, the power of it in a region, uh, how it needs to be accessible for everybody. She shared personally about the way in which it's transformative in her own being, right? Uh, I got to meet Ryan recently and he's a new member to Plexus. Do you know what is really amazing to me is when queer people step into spaces that we're not supposed that they say we're not supposed to be in, right? When we're leading in places, when we're small business owners, and then specific, specifically when we're getting into sport and wellness, and that is something that Ryan is doing in a really amazing way. And what I was super excited about is the way in which uh, he's creating a culture of welcoming, right? And that's the most beautiful thing I think about queer culture and community is it's, it's affirming. We're trying harder, right? We know what it's like to be delimited and not be able to be in a space. So we have a little bit of a sports theme going here. And I'm just getting to meet you, Carly. What I was really excited about is I've listened to your podcast when Sean was on most recently. I got to listen in. It was a w- little bit of a way to get to know uh, Shauna as a new colleague, but just all the different ways in which even how you introduced yourself, how you're working in this very intersectional way. And a lot of times when we're talking about sports, we're not just talking about, you know, hoops and balls and all this different stuff. We're talking about people, we're talking about decisions, we're talking about money, we're talking about business, right? Uh, We're talking about impacts on people's lives. So with all that, my first question for you all is, you know, what does visibility mean to you? And why is visibility so important for our community as a whole, as a queer community? And then specifically as trans folks, what's the power of visibility? Um, I think for me, visibility is in many ways a, I think it's a double-edged sword because in one way it is beautiful and it is amazing. I've had so many people come up to me over the years and have remarked to me that seeing me live my life and my truth is something that they value, that it's helped them find the truth in their own lives and that they've been able to see themselves through seeing me as, in a phrase that I really like, a possibility model. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where visibility can be so beautiful is seeing queer people and trans people out in the world, happy, living their lives, being a part of society, just like everybody else can be a really strong and powerful thing. I but that. I think the other side of that, though, too, is sometimes visibility isn't always good. Okay. We would not be in this legislative moment if it weren't for those positive visibilities and a desire to change that. And okay. I think it's important to look at that. And you can also look at visibility as when people are more noticeably trans than not. I think being aware of how even sometimes well-meaning comments like, 
making sure that you are asking everybody their pronouns and not just someone that you've clocked as trans. Right. Because I think that's where visibility can feel very ostracizing, even when it's done in a way that's intended to be positive. Mm -hmm. Intentions, you gotta check them at the door. What's the impact you do, right? Yeah. Ryan, how about you? And then Carly, I'm gonna come in over to you. Absolutely. I think that um, you know the the visibility and representation is so huge because there really wasn't representation or dialogue. Uh, you know, you look generations back, and you know, growing up for me, like I might as well have been like, oh, when I grow up, I want to be a unicorn because like it wasn't seen. It was like you're just making this thing up. But now that you see the representation, the dialogue, it's not just new that oh, this is just now. We're just have verbiage to have representation, so it creates opportunity. But similar to what Shauna was saying. It also opens up, you know, for you know, discrimination and, you know, the, the, the negativity, but having the conversations of how do we, you know, approach something, you know, politely and respectively, because I'm trying to help or want to know more, create education versus it's just something to talk about. Do you know what I mean? You can very well mm -hmm. read the room if you, if you will, I can, I can ask them. <laughs> um, you, you know, when someone's asking out of concern and education, I want to learn and get better versus we're going to talk about this at the water cooler. Right. So that's something that is you're highly aware of in a, uh, you know situations, but creating a safe space and when you start having dialogue, I have members, I have you know families and people I've worked with just of sharing my story, but they're like, hey, I have someone at work. How can I best support them in intention versus perception and just really using the framework of dialogue in a, an intentional, mindful way and own it if you step in it, but correct it and move forward. Right. And so also just like being visible or out or like open to having conversation doesn't mean that people yeah. don't have boundaries. It doesn't mean that people are not allowed to say no to you. <laughs> I don't want to talk about this right now. And not even and like full stop, not even have to give an explanation. Right. And even if you've had conversations before with that same person in that moment, somebody circle can back for consent or, hey, is this an OK time? You know, are you open to this conversation? And the answer could be no or, hey, no, not right now. But when it's more convenient, I'd love to help fill in the blank. Absolutely. Yeah, Carly, what, what, what does visibility mean to you? What brings you joy? What brings a burden around visibility? Well, I want to answer that question by answering a question that we got in the chat. And by the way, if you have questions in the chat, I respond to those. Mm -hmm. So please, please, I mean, I like, I like being very interactive in the dialogue because I think that's how we learn and how we grow. And I'm a believer that what Ryan talked about a minute ago, if you step in it, own it. First step is don't be afraid to step in it. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing. Don't be afraid to have the conversation. And someone may say, you know what? I can't, I don't have the capacity right now, but come to me later and we can, and we can chop it up. And we can talk it out. The question was from Jenny in the chat. How are you living your full life, creating a new possibility for others? Um, in a lot of ways, how am I living my life? Just by first off, you know, Woody Allen said it best. Most of life just showing up. And that is the way that I've approached my own life and also my own transition. Um, my mentor at the beginning of my own process told me something very important. I keep it close to my heart all the time that you have to be out in the world to let people know that you're in the world. And it's very important. And, and she said, the reason we need to be out, we need to be present is to let people know we're there. Because often, and for myself, I have no problem educating. I have a lot of spoons, I have a lot of spoons I can use, and I want people to have the conversation, especially when I'm in the spaces that I enjoy being in. As, as you probably guessed, I'm a sports fan. I'm a sports nut, I play sports, I play sports, I do a podcast that's essentially on sports. And I've had this, I've had this occur at races where I'm, I'm towing the line for a race, getting myself together, and someone asked me about what's it like to be, I mean, What's it like to be an athlete and be trans? Mm -hmm. And we can have that conversation. And, and more often times, trust me, we have good BS detectors as trans people because we have to. It keeps us alive. So we know if you're asking in bad faith or you're asking in good faith. But I find that most people, they're in good faith. They really want to know because most people, most people aren't jerks. They want a real explanation away from the noise. And what you're hearing out there from the people like that person at CPAC over the last weekend, yes, we're gonna, we're gonna put it in the space, we gotta talk about that. That's the noise. And right. the best way to get around the noise 
is actually like, day you have a panel of people in the community here. Get the real, not the noise. And that for me, that's, that's why visibility is important to me because each one, because we have a belief as black people, each one teach one. Mm -hmm. And I'm a believer that each one who comes up, I have an opportunity to teach. I'm going to take advantage of the opportunity because believe me, a transphobe is going to spoon feed it to you and they don't want you listening to anyone else. That is their, that's their MO. And that's the way it's always been for bigoted people. Their own MO is we're going to give you the playbook because we just don't like those people over there. So it's incumbent on me to give you the playbook. Now, all the things that Sean and Ryan have said are very true. Visibility is a double-edged sword. It can be a burden, but mainly it's a burden not so much because of well-meaning people. It's a burden more because unfortunately a lot of people get the noise instead of coming to where coming to the source of the knowledge, which is LGBTQ people in your workplace, LGBTQ people in your social settings, in your club, and most importantly, this is important now in your families, in your families, because there is, there's, there's cousin Ted who just came out to you or Aunt Priscilla who came out to you. Oftentimes that is where, that is where the, the allyship can start, the accompliship can start, but it's also where the bullying and the noise can start too. Yeah, so, you know, one thing when you're talking about families that I, in that same way, when we're talking about the power of advocacy that we have within our workplace, we also need to remember that families are the first organizations that we've ever been in. This is where we learn a lot of organizational dynamics and what happens in our family and what happens at home, it comes with us. We bring it with us, right? So when we're learning there, when we're leaning in, when we're showing up in compassion, when we're bringing humility to our learning, that helps us do that also in our work. They're not separated out, right? Right. And a lot of times too, we hope that you all think about here at this panel, you can bring this home and say, hey, you know what? I heard this really interesting conversation. What somebody said was this. What do you think about that, right? If you learn something when you're at work about a way that you stepped in and you messed it up and you didn't even realize it, it was 10 years ago with your, your brother or your sister or your, your sibling, right? You can go back to it and say, hey, I learned along the way here. So I wanna bring it back over to Shauna and Ryan, see if there's anything else there. And then we do have a lot of activation happening here in the chat. So I'm gonna cross, I'm gonna read that and then bring those questions in a bit. So Ryan and Shauna, anything else that you wanted to bring in and share in response to what Carly framed for us? Um, I think like, honestly, I agree with what both of you are saying on this. And I think that's, you know, as someone who does also tend to be, I'm, I have a lot of space to answer those questions. Like you'll hear like you know, people say spoons, but like it's really, it's just the, I'm, I have no qualms about being someone who can be a resource because those things are very easy for me to do. And like, as also like Carly said, being someone who can talk about it, I'd rather they talk to me as opposed to someone else because I know I can do it. And I think just making sure, you know, if you do, make a mistake on let's say someone's pronouns and you're corrected, I think the worst thing you can do is self-flagellate yourself. Like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I can't believe I did this. And cause that's really centering you there and just be like, oh, so, of course. And so say they, he, she, et cetera, actually blah, blah, blah. And I think making sure just like fixing it and moving on is the best thing to do in those circumstances. And I just wanted to make sure I had a space to say that because I feel like that's something that's a very simple thing to do, especially for allies, that is making sure that that's the focus and not on yourself and your misstep. And that's the because like missteps are going to happen with everybody. I've gotten the people's pronouns wrong as, and I'm a trans woman. Like, it's just a thing that sometimes will happen, be it intentionally or otherwise, because you sometimes you just don't know. Or maybe someone came out in the last year in the time you haven't talked about them. And instead of, and the best way to do it is just make a space for it and move forward with their new, with the pronoun that you now know is the correct one. Yeah, it's really great. And it translates over too, right? As a white person, someone calls me in on my racism or being ignorant of something. Thanks. Thanks for telling me. I'm sorry. Right. Thank you for trying. 
I'm working Thank on you that. for trusting me to tell is how I always think. I would rather someone be able to tell me that I fucked up or messed up than like say, I know. That's the language. Like, I, I mean, this like, is not yeah. easy stuff. I mean, cuss words are real words. So let's try to avoid yeah. what you're saying. But you know, we got it. I'll explain them to you when you're older. It's okay. Um, no, I think you, it's interesting. You, you mentioned the word uh, ignorance. And I think there's a difference. So like ignorance isn't not knowing, it's not wanting to know and how we frame that, right? So the, and just like, you know, Shauna said, don't pontificate and sit in like, I'm so sorry. Like I had no, like we move, like move through it. We're used to, you know, attention or this or that, or people trying to read the room and um, it's correcting, educating and, you know, leading from a place of owning the narrative because I think people step it like step into things like oh I know all about this or like you know what they've heard versus I would rather own the narrative and tell my story and let them take it from there versus other people trying to tell my story for me that makes sense it does we have some questions can I bring them into the into the conversation here uh you know Shauna I think you touched on this and Carly you might have also um so when we're talking about gender identity even as expansive as we want to get, these binary ideas of what is feminine and what is masculine and how we're supposed to perform within those binaries uh, get really prescriptive and they can be very dangerous, right? So a lot of times we try to talk to people of like, what is your uh, dress code policy and how can you just make it common sense and not gendered, right? So people just know what you're allowed to wear on any given day to be able to do your job well. So it looks like we have a conversation here or a question here, and I think I'm understanding it, but basically, are there some educational options or maybe advice or ways you can help frame, right? So if we got some educational things in here, we'll drop them into the chat or we'll circle back around. But we have some folks, some colleagues that are intolerant of trans colleagues uh, in the community who may choose to dress and not androgynous, right? So somebody in the, in the workplace says, my pronouns are she, her, I'm a trans woman. And I'm wearing these work boots and these jeans and these masculine clothes or androgyny, right? And so we see this enforcement of these expectations. So what do you all think about what's some advice to how to explain that, um, how to show up and interrupt it or any um, uh, recommendations? Also, I, that was like a triple barrel question, you I'm sorry. I'm only supposed to ask a single barrel. So they come in well, here. I do want to take that. I want to take You're that following first me. Part. I got you. Let's go. I want to take, I want to take that first part because that is recommendations for an educational option. The, fir the first educational option is you as fellow coworker speak out. Yeah. You hear something intolerant, check that person like you're a defenseman in the NHL. Check mm -hmm. them against the boards, step up and speak out and say, not in our workplace. Mm -hmm. The first line of defense is you, is you right. standing up for a coworker. That first line of defense is you. Right. From there, however, if there's because and see, this is an interesting question, because in many ways, business fashion has changed. That's right. I mean, the, the fact of the matter, the fact of the matter is business fashion has changed drastically in the last five years. In, and more and more workplaces are realizing that, OK, you're really going to are you are you going to really cast out good people because they may have a piercing? may have a tattoo, work, work attire is a little bit queer. And in some places, the fact of the matter is, if, if you have a trans woman who's also the, the line person for your electric company, that's what it is. They're, they're, it's not about fashion at that point. It's about making sure they don't electrocute themselves, making sure your house has power. So in many ways, at one level, see it for what it is. But also at another level, if you, if you see something, don't be afraid to say something, speak out. And at another level, if it turns out that your workplace probably needs broad scale education, that's when you go to advocacy spaces, like go to your local LGBTQ center, go to support groups, go, go to groups like the Stonewall Speakers. I'm a Stonewall Speaker, and I enjoy walking in to say an office environment and having these, and having these conversations and giving ideas and giving a piece to my experience, because oftentimes, a lot of what we of what on the first glance looks to be intolerance is really people don't know. And the mm -hmm. fact of the matter is you don't know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people are, I mean, I won't be the first to tell you, you it's, it's a lot for a good number of people. I understand where a lot of people are coming from. 
for many people, while, while being trans is not new, right. there have been trans people as long as there have been people on this planet, the fact that now that it's right for many people, it is a, it's a new thing for a person who is trans or a person who's gender non-conforming to be directly in their workspace and working on a project with them. And you, again, you don't know what you don't know. So get the knowledge, bring people in. Don't be afraid to, afraid to bring experts into the room because when you know better, that's the first step to doing better. Mm -hmm. And ultimately that's what it comes down to, knowing better. And, it's, and it's possible. And you know what it makes you think about too around the family. We have a lot of children in our lives. For those of you who know us, you can deflate that and stand up in a kind of a lot of different ways. I like the way they dress. Sorry, you have a problem with it. Um, how is that your business? How is that harming you? I mean, you can ask my child, Dylan Rose, how many times I have to ask her, how is that harming you? And how is that your business? So you can ask a colleague that same thing. And you know, honestly, you know what? I'd like, you know, you want to go grab some lunch? I'm not sure what the problem is for you. Uh, maybe we could have a conversation about it, right? Or you can be a lineman, defensive lineman. I'm learning all kinds of sports things. Shauna, Ryan, uh, what, what are your thoughts? Um, so like, I think my thoughts are, and this is also going with the, um, the discriminate, like what to do with legislation and what to do also, like if I could speak in on that point. Yeah. I think the best thing, contact your representatives, your senators, show up at these meetings because they are meeting in the state houses, they're meeting in local or in local cities. They are put, trying to push these legislations and, you know, educate yourself on like the facts. Like if where they see there's a lot of trans kids coming out. I always like to think there's a very popular graph of the, the graph of uh, trans kids coming out is the exact same as the graph of left handedness when they stopped make, like punishing people for being left handed. It's when you stop holding when you stop having the standard and holding people to it. Don't be surprised when there is a growth that ultimately then levels off because it's reaching a norm that was already there. And I think being aware of things like that is can go a long way. Yeah, don't tire of contacting your legislators, right? Know what's going on in other states. Carly got on this call before you all were here. And she said, they had a hearing today on HB6 in Ohio, in my state, Carly and I even here, right? So make sure we're knowing what's going on in other places as well. So we can bring that forward. Absolutely. And, you know, and being like the fact that Ohio is, you know, um, Representative Gary Click from Southern Ohio has been a real thorn in the LGBTQIA community side for the last two legislative sessions. And making sure that, you know, people like that know that they are like, and it might not do much because ultimately they're not as concerned with facts because they are very, they're more ide ideologically driven. And it's hard to debate that, but they need to know that they're ideas are not popular and that there are people who will stand up and oppose them that aren't just trans people because we are often seen as unable to be the proper representatives that we are we are inherently biased for being trans of our own experience and thus our opinions and perspectives are less valued for it when i would dare say think that it should be more but to them it's less so so that's where allies can be so important and speak up and corroborate our lives and experiences because we need that right now more than ever right i think to piggyback about something that you know you mentioned sean about you know um, looking at, you know, setting a standard and we talk about holding people to those standards. And you think about how you guys run your organizations or your leadership teams of where are we leading, managing and holding accountable and yeah. how we do anything is how we do everything. So if mm -hmm. you're going to be holding people accountable to whatever, you know, standards of, of, of your operations, like this is something to include on how you show up for everybody in your organization, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. Um, the we, we have an accountability chart we talk about core you know core values and the things about for us is you know driving change and creating impact and exceeding expectations but there's also for us is one that says take ownership and as you look at how you treat your your team how your team culture is because everything's predicated around culture and if your teams aren't feeling safe seen or, or heard how do they show up to do work in part of your team as best as their best self absolutely 
Right, and so for many of you who are here, you are culture leaders in your organizations, maybe in some very multinational, large organizations, complex. Uh, bring it back to your company values, right? Um, Carly, we were talking earlier today when we're, when we're trying to make the case of, hey, we need to have an advocacy or a stance here. It is about business. It is about money. It is about commerce. It is about perception, right, of this company and of this location. So while it can feel gross, to take real lives and lived experience and the importance of just trying to survive and thrive and young people, especially, sometimes we have to put it into that other language. So knowing your audience, right? That's the thing why we're gonna share this GLAD article because it helps you think about it from a reporting lens, how to speak on it. Another part when you're talking about allies, these, this transgender student participation in sports, censorship and education, drag performances in front of young people and access to healthcare are all targeting young people. So it is putting pressure on families. And like, I don't know where everybody thinks like my lesbian moms are, but most of our families are straight and not trans, like most of them, right? So the fact is that a lot of people, uh, straight parents, right? Cisgender parents are coming up in the line to try and protect their kids and make those choices. So that's why I shared that conversation, the article from the Buckeye Flame there, just thinking about the toll of constantly having to testify and I'm learning a little bit about this. Shauna's more familiar because uh, her partner has ran uh, political campaigns and is showing up over at state houses all the time. Um, they throw out a lot of red meat. They throw out uh, to bring out the sharks and it's a lot of misdirection. And so we organize and we get everybody there and then we go and you put your whole life into it. And then it's moved over into council and it's moved over here. It's a shell game of trauma is what is happening not right. So being familiar and thinking about what might be happening in your organization for the parents of trans kids or the parents of queer kids and making sure you're checking in with them. Also your media sources, right? What are you reading? What are you paying attention to? Are you following the Buckeye Flame? Are you listening to Carly's podcast? Bring those other voices in on a regular basis and then just make it like lunch conversation. Hey, so I was thinking about the trans athlete theme today. I mean, literally just weave this into your everyday. Did you know that there's only three kids who are participating? Like right. things like that are so powerful. And I think especially when, you know, it's seen as this like scourge to be defeated when the important thing is, especially at a high school level, the important thing is learning teamwork, cooperation, getting along with others. Right. How to be a gracious winner and a gracious loser. Core values. That's what high school sports are so important for. It's not focusing on winning, losing. Sure, everyone loves to win, but that's not what sports are about for kids. And I right. think real remembering that these kids are people first and foremost, not ideas, not a concept but real actual people is so important. And I think that really gets lost to us. And Andy brings in something here in the chat. So even when we have like New York Times, which is seen as a leading progressive voice that it gives fair coverage to the LGBTQ community and the trans community, they are specifically being called in uh, and, and the receipts are there for the ways in which the coverage of trans voices and lives is unfair, is skewed, and is not the high level and caliber of reporting. Okay. So Andy shared that, so please check in on that. Also yeah. right to local places. And then Shauna, you, you brought this to my attention too, right? So as much as I want to talk about it as a cisgender person, oh, I can't believe this, da-da-da-da-da. If I'm talking to you about that all the time, Shauna, every time you come into work, how is that putting a burden and load on you? So I need to be paying attention about it, but I need to be paying attention to the way in which I can just be trauma triggering the people more directly affected by it as a cisgender person. It's not affecting me in the same lived way, right? And I think to your point about how bringing that in the office, I think something that I've like realized that over this past month, I've, I have been bringing a lot of trans trauma to the office because the onslaught has been a lot. Right. There's constant legislative attacks. The, my news cycles are constantly overwhelmed with negative news. Things like the New York Times kerfuffle. And I think it's interesting to note that the Times ERG Times Out has spoken up against that internally. And one of the recent things, and I thought that was really relevant here, how what ERGs can do to help their organizations move forward. How even seeing that in the New York Times, how while they haven't been successful, imagine how if there wasn't that dedicated force speaking out, how much worse it could be for it. But I anyway, but my but to my point, I 
realizing that I'm bring that all of these things can weigh heavily. And I really appreciate that in our office, you've given me space to vent and talk about it, to explain and have that room to be all of myself. And that includes realizing that this is a difficult time to be trans more so like in this particular moment because of all of that, that all of that hostility weighs on your coworkers, friends and family members in a way that you might not always see that everyone might not always feel comfortable talking to you about, but it's still a very real thing that's likely affecting them. Right. So that brings up a question to Carly and Ryan. Um, how do we have joy, right? <laughs> do you have a prescription for joy, for balance, for care? You know, what does that look like for you as individuals, if you'd like to share? What's the organizational practice around protecting joy and providing care when it's hard out here? And we're going completely off script. And I, I love you three for just going with me, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to blame you all because, and, and the folks in the chat for just doing this. So this is not our three questions. So thanks for letting me throw that one out there. Well, I'm going to put, well, I'm going to put a little bit of, of trans joy in the chat right now. This was this was the edition of my of my podcast from the week before the Super Bowl, okay. when I had a certain Shauna Atkinson on on the show, and not only were we talking about like preview, we were talking about I'm previewing the Super Bowl, but we were also talking about things like all this legislation and the Oscars, and we were with our other friend Chelsea Poe, and that is that is trans joy for me in many ways, being in community. And being able to just be in community and just talk to other people and at one level talk about the hurt and the pain, but also get away from that noise mm -hmm. and talk about the thing. I mean, we were, I mean, we spent a, a good portion of, we spent a little bit of the podcast talking about Kim Petras winning a Grammy Award. And Kim Petras is the first, uh, was the first transgender woman to win a Grammy directly for performance. Now a trans woman has won a Grammy. She won it for composing, but the idea was just talking. We we talk. We we lament. We cry about our lamentations, but we also celebrate our wins. Mm -hmm. And I, in fact, I've had Sean on the show since last August like four times. Sean has been awesome. Uh, we we did a preview for the college football playoff championship game, where also that same weekend, Shauna was heading off with the dodgeball team off to some big tournament. Mm -hmm. So we were able to like get a preview of, and by the way, um, in case you didn't know, Shauna is a serious, she can, she can play some dodgeball, y'all. You need somebody for your dodgeball team, there you, there's the free agent pickup right there. And is but that maybe it's, a good, good, good way to interrupt those problematic things, just keep some dodgeballs and just throw some dodge, you know, no, just like when oh, yeah. you're playing dodgeball no. with your problematic comments. No, I mean, maybe, yeah. I'm making jokes, sorry. Well, no, you're so okay. <laughs> no, no, but I think there's something to that though, is the, you know, a trans joy for me uh, to go off of what Carly was saying is not just that community, which is going to be my point too. And she took it, but no, but, um, <laughs> but the, but it is being myself and knowing that making space and like, see, honestly, the reason why sports and fighting for participation is an important cause for me personally is because I saw the impact in my life on having a team like playing women's sports was important to me and finding us that camaraderie that was frankly rare and unique to me pre like it was such a wonderful experience to have that sense of belonging and dodgeball is a very like even when it's straight it's a very queer sport is kind of it's like it's like it's very roller derby-esque in that regard and I really appreciate that about it that it's such a accepting space and I've really been very fortunate to find community there both in our local league and on a national level where I will be participating in the USC dodgeball premier tour this upcoming season so yeah Ryan what about you projecting joy cultivating joy absolutely um it's interesting you know we talk about uh team and camaraderie because as it's, you know, as, as nature would have it, you know, we're, we're tribal people. No one's like, I'm going to do everything alone. Right. And with what I do and, you know, 
in the fitness space of, you know, working with people and how they move in their bodies and how they're already uncomfortable in their skin as they are, let alone possibly being in the wrong skin or doing, you know, of that nature, you think about how you move throughout your day, because where do we practice self-care? Where do we take care of ourselves so we can still advocate and talk for other people and, and do the things to create the impact and create conversation, right? I love being able to, you know, connect with folks and have, you know, shared experiences or those that understand where I'm coming from, but also like have dialogue and creating, a, you know, education or changing the lens or perspective that we might not think about because we see through our lens, right? And sometimes we see things as as we are, not as they are. Um, mm -hmm. But I think activity and just the general movement and, and exercise creating such, you know, good chemical effects, not just physically, but mentally and emotionally, it, it's a game changer. Like those those magic moments of somebody being able to move through their day more comfortably or having better energy or feeling stronger or feeling more confident because let's be honest and I, I'll get real, but like when we're more confident, we tolerate less bullshit. Like and when we're not comfortable in our skin, we tolerate less than treatments. Mm. And it's a matter of that self-belief and reinforcing the the movie that we keep playing in our head versus can we change the lane? Can we change the movie and rewrite the narrative or write the next chapter and call it, you know, my turn, right? So I talk about that a lot in coaching with people, but I think in our experience, we have a different lens but we know what it's like to be uncomfortable and want to make change and how do we go about that and do it in the best way right and so you know one of the things i love the most about uh, well first of all that there are lgbt chambers of commerce uh, amazing right um but it's really important right so we we know that we have members that are therapists that are counselors that are body workers that are coaches uh, that run gyms and they are queer led or they are doing the work of an ally. They're not just joining to get some decal because we know how are you showing up as an ally? And so uh, Andy also asked, Andy, I mean, are you, are you trying out to be a panelist on a future thing? I mean, I, I haven't met you yet and think so. I don't know, but like you won. Uh, but the question here too is like, and we, this is something that we do in our family. Who did you help today? And who helped you, right? So this is something you can use in your teams. But the question here uh, that Andy, I think I got your name right, asked was, how am I as an ally, right? How am I helping, right? And why am I helping that way? You can look at it a little bit more. And so look and, and see where those skills are. It's a really good point, uh, point there. Any other thoughts about this before we come in on our last question? Because I, I would never let y'all go. We'll just walk around on Zoom all day. We'll be talking all day. So any other thoughts? Um, on this subject here or other tangent before I ask my last question of you all. Okay. So one of our, so again, you know, lots of times we hear from employee resource groups that you're upset or worried that you're mostly allies combined. Well, hopefully the thing is, as you do more ERG work, uh, the LGBTQ folks are going to come out and they're going to let you know and they're going to be there or, or your work is going to is gonna tear up, it's gonna get up to senior level leadership like Steve said in the chat. Uh, it's gonna impact your recruitment. You're gonna pay, you're gonna have inclusive policies. And so we're gonna come and stay at your organizations. But it's also okay <laughs> that it's mostly allies, right? It's That's also okay. So a lot of times what we're talking about here is around allyship. So this is coming in for my last question. And I think we talked on this a little bit more, but I wanna drill in on it. You know, um, we have to caution allies uh, that being out and proud, right? Celebrating somebody being out can have inverse effects. So you got to know, you got to slow down. So what are some ways that cis folks specifically might be trying to be allies, but then they get in the way of allyship. They, they do the opposite of allyship or Carly, as I heard you say earlier, they're not really showing up as an accomplice, right? When we're an accomplice, I'm putting my hand on the pole alongside you so they can't get to you. Um, if they're trying, you know, anyway, so uh, let me bring it in. Sometimes I get lost in my own thoughts. So my question is again, what are some ways that, you know, cis folk like me I might be trying to be an ally, but I might get in the way. Um, and then I can also share my own if it doesn't come up. One of the ways I really, I really messed this up. I've messed this up. So yeah, who wants to go? Carly, you're always, you're always ready. I'm going to call on you. I mean, I feel like you're sitting on your hand. I was, I was hoping Sean would go first. This child, but I, feel I, like... was hoping Sean, I was hoping Sean would go first so she could take my answer for a change. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, please. I insist. No. Well, the a main way allies get in the way is simply not listening. 
Okay. You figure that you went to some training or you went to some seminar and all of a sudden you're going to tell me about my life. Mm -hmm. uh, that is the biggest mistake I find is like, no, you mm -hmm. see your, your role. And you know, to quote the rock for any wrestling fans, know your role mm -hmm. and your role first and foremost is to listen from the, listen to the people that are directly affected. When I'm in, I'll give you an example of this. I often get a I often get a question, for, especially from parents who call Trans Lifeline, and they ask. Um, it's like this. Good afternoon, this is Trans Lifeline. How may I help you today? Oh, well, I'm I'm a parent, and my child just came out to me as trans, and I I know about the things like the 41 percent suicide rate, and I know those things. I don't want that to be my child. How can I best be an effective ally for my child? The answer I always get first is listen. Listen, go back to your child or in your workplace, go back to that person who may confide in you, come out to you and ask the question. Don't be afraid to ask, how can I best support you? What do you need from me? How can I, how can I best support you? Take, take it off. A lot of times people are like, well, how can I be a better ally? No. How can I best support you? And then, and then from there, when you ask that question, what you're doing is you're respecting the agency of that person. And that is the first step to not being that ally who fumbles. Understand that it's not about you. The person at the center is that person that you want to be there for. So take it off of you, put it on them. And then from there, be prepared to listen because they're going to let you know what they need. And then from there, then you act. But you act on their advisement, not on your own. If there's a question that you have, before you go to them, do your own research. Google is your friend. And then if there's something you're not sure about, Come to them and say, hey, I checked this out on Google, but I want to get I want to get your eyes on this. What do you think? And if they have the capacity to do it, more often than not, if you do it that way, that person's going to have the capacity. But the first step to avoid the ally pitfall is listen. Listen and then act on being told. And one more, and one more important point on listening. Uh, mm -hmm. When we're telling you about our lives, trust me, we know our lives better than you. Mm -hmm. So, and the fact is. Most of the people who actually really are effective allies, they don't say, well, I know this and I know that. You know what they say more often than not? I asked the trans person, they told me about their life. I listened and I believed them. That's why I'm effective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it goes back to humility, cultural humility, not competency, right? We don't take a class and all of a sudden competent. You come in like, tell me more. I wanna understand also before you go to the Google, uh, trans-led organizations, uh, leading trans organizations in America. That's the reason, right? You want to go to the Trevor Project. You want to go to Trans Law. You want to go to Marsh P. Johnson. You know, you want to go. Uh, you want to go to organizations that you're involved in. Um, yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. The role thing is interesting because you know, in any situation, it's you know. I, I even do this like when I started having conversations with my with my parents and my father specifically, and he would we he went to therapy to learn how we could better communicate so how he could best support me as a parent and just as a human being. But we developed a rapport of, hey, do you just need my ears right now or do you want input or feedback or dialogue, right? So that's a really cool setting of like, hey, what you know, how can I best support you? Hey, do you need ears or do we want to have a dialogue, right? Um, but you know, like, like Carly said, we know our story, like that's our narrative. I, 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 we've lived it versus someone telling me, oh, I already, I, I know this. I think the four most dangerous words are, I already know that because we've limited our growth. We've hit a ceiling or, you know, it's the same thing. I, you know, tell people like, oh, well, I know what I need to do, but I'm not doing it. I'm like, I already know that knowledge is its potential. What is the action that is the power or that is empowering, right? So that's a huge piece in the framework, just dialogue and, and knowing the role, but how do I best support and what do you need from me in listening or do you want dialogue?
yeah, I think you both just really like, I think that's really summed up a lot. And I really, I think that point generally, do you want solutions or do you want to feel heard? Yeah. Are both, I think that is very applicable even beyond this conversation. So it's a conversation that's very much helped my household as someone, you know, is the like, I don't necessarily need you to fix my problem. I just need you to hear that I'm having a problem. And that in and of itself is giving me what I need. And oftentimes that is enough is yeah. just to let people feel heard. Yeah. And that's why we're so grateful for you all being here and to hear our conversations and to be a part of this dialogue because ultimately you all are such an important part of this and of where we're going to go if we're going to move out of this moment. And so mm -hmm. thank, I wanna make sure I say thank you. Yes. I am There's very gay married because of the do you need solutions or do you need to feel heard question? Like literally we weren't gonna make it past that second year if we didn't learn that skill. So here's the other thing, right? These things that we're talking about here, individual and their system, apply them everywhere. It's not just in this one bucket around being uh, aware of things. Sorry, but Ryan, I think I stepped on you, please. Oh no, like I'm just smiling, nodding, but, but I'm just, I'm grateful to share this space. But what I, I feel is um, these are meaningful moments, right? And, you know, they, you know, people don't always remember, you know, what you said, but they remember how you make them feel. And if you can mm -hmm. make somebody, somebody feel safe or welcome, you can't change their life if you don't have that space to do that. So if I want to change someone's life. I can't get them through the door. I could have the most amazing workout or amazing team or coaching, whatever. If I can't make them feel comfortable, I can't change their life. And how do you set that for the people to come to you as, as leaders or, you know, managers or just part of a team and colleagues to, to have those conversations. So when somebody feels comfortable enough to share something with you, holy smokes, like, what does that, what does that say that they feel seen and they, they know that they can have these un uncomfortable conversations unpack and then it's a ripple effect because there's someone else in your organization or someone who has a, a best friend, cousin, aunt, you know, whatever it is that you can then impact. And then I shared my story. I transitioned publicly within my business and with my team and my members. And little by little, I'd get knocks on my door. They're like, Hey, do you have a, do you have a, do you, do you have a second? And I'm like, well, I'm like, of course, is everything okay? And they're like, they start to close the door and I'm thinking, Oh my goodness, what happened? And they're like, I have someone at work. And like, I saw your video you posted, like, can I ask you something like, my office is conversational. Like we have coffee and couch. Like what is, what is your space even saying? Can you invite them in to have a conversation? Just, you know what I mean? Yeah. And also having like transitioned at my old job at the daily legal news, like it's so like having those conversations is such a, you know, being that someone like I was, you know, when I came out almost a decade ago, I was the first trans person. Most of the people in my life had met just as a general thing, like, and like, not just had an idea of, but to actually know and to be able to, and like, you know, I'm very lucky that I can be, was able to be there and to be that, but those conversations aren't always the easiest. And especially when people do have their own misconceptions and pre-ideas that they're bringing into these conversations, it can be really difficult for that. I used to do speakers panels in undergrad at Indiana in Bloomington. And, um, most people's first exposure of, uh, you know, any uh, trans person at that point was, it was Jerry Springer. Like these are things that be feared, oh, pitied, laughed at. Like they're not like part of society that can have an education and go to work and maintain a relation. Like that's their, it's like a carnival, right? And if anything, I think that's, I think you really hit a nail on the head there. I think that's where some of this current cultural backlash is really coming from this. I still want to be this mean to trans people because that is what our culture was like i'll be honest you can't watch an adam sandler movie from the 2000s and not have a very transphobic dig in there it's just very present in like like i can't watch how i met your mother again because i'm like nope that show is just going to remain in my memories because all of those shows are so transphobic and those moments of just that was how trans people were represented was solely as a joke in that same vein, I highly recommend the documentary Disclosure on Netflix. I got you. Put it it um, Laverne Cox and um, uh, what you, uh, I'm blanking on her name, Jennifer. Um, anyway, either way, it's very good. And it talks about how the history of trans represent representation in Hollywood and how that has such a trickle down effect on our culture. I, it's definitely worth a listen and a watch. And I think it's something that a lot of people could learn from if you're looking for something to become more knowledgeable from other experts in their lives, disclosure. Yep. Yeah.
No, that was an excellent documentary. Mm -hmm. And, and also, much props to Ryan for being a for being a fellow Big Ten kid. <laughs> <laughs> I Where was there when go? Bobby Knight was fired with the riots on campus, all of it. I was there. Oh yeah. God. I worked with Crazy. Bobby Knight. I Did worked you? with Coach Knight. The first time I ever got first time I ever got cussed out in a press conference was from Coach Knight. I'm wearing my <laughs> surprise game. face. <laughs> <laughs> covering a prep when I was in college, covering a game, covering a game. Uh, I went to Northwestern. Okay. I was up, uh, I was on our I was on our broadcast team for a game at IU Bloomington. Yeah. And it was a game where, I mean, this was back when when Indiana was like, they were headed for a, they ended up going to the Final Four that year, but they beat us by like just, they beat us by thirty. Bobby Knight was not happy, and you could tell he was not happy. He felt the team underachieved. So I asked him. So I asked Bobby, "Where did you think Indiana fell short tonight? Because you didn't seem happy. You didn't seem happy. Where do you feel they're falling short?" And first, because I was like, what the F kind of question is that? Why did they let student reporters in here? But then he asked the question, then he answered it. <laughs> and the funny thing is, I worked with him, worked with him 20 years later at ESPN. And I came up to him and said, do you remember the, you remember the kid you cussed out at, uh, after the Northwestern game? He apologized to me. <laughs> yeah. So, but, but that's it. But what Ryan was talking about is very important. Say it, making a play, being a safe harbor for someone, it matters. I do want, I want to give a quick anecdote to understand how important that was, mm -hmm. because what I, what Shana was talking about being that, that's very real for a lot of people coming out, they're coming out into a place that's, you have to understand the world is unsafe in many ways. And the worlds that are even closest to us offices, families, clubs, churches, they can be unsafe. I thought I was writing into that because last summer I came out to a lot of my family because a lot of my family did not know. I mean, a lot of my family with outside of a few people, they didn't know because I was honestly afraid to tell them that, no, this is happening. But mm -hmm. I had a death in the family and I had to go home mm -hmm. and I had to show up. And one of the first people I came and I had a cousin who I'd only talked to via Zoom and the phone for the last four or five years because we couldn't meet each other, especially COVID kind of really messed things up as far as plans we had made. I would have come out a lot sooner if it wasn't for COVID. Thank you, COVID. But mm -hmm. I ended up going home and this cousin, when I hit town, this cousin was texting me like, hey, you here yet? I really want to see you. Are you here yet? Are you here yet? And I was afraid to meet him because I didn't know what he was going to say because we were really close ever since we were kids. And anyway, I was like, look, I'm at the hotel, come up to the hotel room. I got wine and cheese. I want to talk to you. And I sent a picture of me. And I was like, I don't know what he's going to think now. He walks in. He, look, he looks at me. We sit down. We sip wine. We talk. And the first thing out of his mouth is, you know what? I live in Atlanta. I live in Atlanta. There's two trans people who work for me. This is not a big deal. I'm just glad you're you, and I'm glad you're here, yeah. because the family needs you to be here. At that moment, the fact that he was willing to listen, willing to and willing to just listen and take it in and say, "No, I'm a safe harbor for you," mm -hmm. that made all the difference in the world. So understand that you can make that just by your listening and just by being there. Yeah. It doesn't take being an being an ally, being an accomplice, being there and showing up is work. But if you really truly step into it, even with your biases, and that's another thing, don't be afraid to step into your biases. Don't be afraid to unpack them. First, don't be afraid to admit them. Mm -hmm. Because if you have biases. It's easy to have biases with what son is talking about because the fact of the matter is you have been programmed with so much. I mean, come on, people. One thing I told my mom when I talked to her and we talked in private. I told my mom, I said, mom, you got to understand. My mom's like, if I had known about this, your kid, I would have been supportive. No, you wouldn't have because you would have been so programmed. Mm -hmm. It's nothing so much that you're a bad person, but, you're, but we're so programmed with these images. I mean, think mm -hmm. about... When you about most people of a certain age in this room, if I ask the question, 
what do you think about if somebody says transgender? Mm -hmm. If you're of a certain age, you'll think some of you will answer Max Klinger if you're a certain age. Others of you will answer Jerry Springer. Some of you will say Ace Ventura. Mm -hmm. That doesn't yeah. necessarily make you bad people. That's just the fact of the culture that we live in. Another reason why disclosure is so important to really so un important. understand where this comes from and unpack this. Right. That's why it's important to look at it. Don't be afraid to step into it. And you know what? As much as we talk about, you don't want to make these mistakes. You know what? You know what happened? You know you are going to make, you're more likely to make a mistake when all your head is thinking about is making mistakes. Right. You're right. more likely to flub a pronoun when you're thinking about it. No, honest first rule, treat that trans person like anyone else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Take, Thank take you, all the hysteria out of the way and just say, no, this is another human being who's in my room, who's in my office, who's on my team, who's in my workplace. And you find out when you start from there, then it's a lot easier to step into all the other stuff you're unsure about. It's easier to get into that question because you're taking, you've taken the noise out. That's another way of removing the noise. And I think our society will get a lot farther, especially with this nonsense that they're trying to pass, if people would just remove the noise. Right, right. Thank you for sharing about your travel home, right? Thank you for sharing that with us. I think to bring us in for a close, one of the things that that also is a reminder of as we're working in these organizational spaces, we never know how somebody's family reunion weekend went. We don't know all the layers and the nuances around that. So back to time and space, hold time and space that we never know what is fully going on for that person, for that human being. And then also to Steve's point in the chat, how can we formalize it? How can we reward it? How can we make it easy to take and create that time and space for sharing, for learning, for vulnerability? How, not only formalizing it, but how can we invest in it? You know, for what I want for you all, and I don't work in the corporate sector, I'm just out here trying to agitate. I want you all to get extra time off for your ERG leadership. I want you to get a stipend. I want you to get gold pins and like blow up clowns, right? But I do want there to be ways that company culture shifts to actually reward and make it easier for you because you're doing work on top of your work, right? So then also just this go out. I mean, I can't even with this big 10, we're gonna never get out of here. Um, but also I went to Antioch College. We didn't have a sports team specifically. So uh, yeah, I'm not the one. Um, but then also to think about the way that you create time and space. So my, uh, if you are in a place where somebody's gonna tell you about their, they're gonna bring you along on their transition journey. Right? They're going to tell you their pronouns they're using. They're going to tell you their name, their new name. They're going to bring you in on that journey. You need to remember to check back in, right? So my thing where I really stepped in this, I had a trusted source that told me a colleague, new name and new pronouns. And I was like, yes, let's go. I assumed that that person had the permission to share. And I was wrong because I made that assumption. So the thing I learned, if I hear secondhand, do you have permission to share this with me, right? Have you been trusted to share this with me? And if so, do you know if I'm trusted to share this with others? Because I introduced this person with their name and their pronouns. And I was like, yes, let's go. And they messaged me and said, I'm actually not coming out at work at this large corporation for three more months, for three more months. So I needed to ask that person secondhand. And then also when someone brings you along on the journey, check in and ask. How would you like me to share this? When would you like me to share this? How do you want me to celebrate and call you by your name here? And how do you want me to switch and code over here and call you by your other name, right? So that's that's confusing, that's overwhelming, that's uncomfortable. Well, listen to Carly's story. Carly having to do that in her own way of having to live dual realities to live, to survive and take her time, right? So it's not, it's not an imposition on me. It might be uncomfortable. It might be outside of my lived experience. I'm going to have to practice at it. I'm going to have to learn it in a different way because I didn't live it. So create time and space, right? To but one thing is when you do time. that, you actually make it easier for that person to move in that direction. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because yeah. often, and, and another thing, if you, expect, and this is really important, the more that you, the more, that you take an active role in making the spaces that you're in safer, the easier you make that process. Because oftentimes 
the thing that hinders people from coming out is not so much that they don't want to, they're worried about the space around them. They're worried about the people around them. They're right. worried about the environment around them. So if you foster, if you begin lay, helping lay that groundwork to make your workplace safer, make your gym safer, make your sports safe space safer, or your civic service space a safer place to be, you make you you help pave the road. Right. And and I'm telling you, as as a trans person. Paving, you you don't realize the value of just being able to help pave the road. That is a very important thing because the more that we help pave the road, the less the, the reason why there's so much noise is because there's so much on paved road. That's the reason why. And, and here's the thing, the people that are making this legislation, they understand this. They understand this because the fact is, and every other thing that they've tried to shut down, the roads already, there are beautiful, smooth highways. Think about mm -hmm. all the things just mm -hmm. in the last 20, in the last 20 to 30 years. For mm -hmm. starters, the pop culture is never going back to what was. Right. It's, it's never go, it is never going back to what was. We're never going back to pre will and grace. It's never going to happen. As much as they're trying to go after, and they know on all those other key things they made a big deal about, they've lost it. So really, to take heart that they realize that they're losing, they're just trying to see how much damage they can do before going out the door. If we continue to plow and pave the road and make our workplaces safer, make our schools safer, make all of our, of all of our spaces and all of our pieces of the world safer, eventually, Eventually, they're going to realize is they're going to pay, they're going to try and pass all this stuff, and people are going to say, "Are you kidding?" Right. What's the big deal? The world is past the build. Continue to build the spaces so that the world is past the ignorant and the scared by. Right. I That's think this is our wonderful place, right? Uh, make new maps and pave the roads, right? So that's where we're at. Um, thank you, Ryan, Carly, and Shauna for saying yes to this, for coming into this space, for stepping into brave space with, with us, with me. Thank you for trusting me. Thank you for opening up and sharing your stories. Thank you for just making everything uh, hopefully more joyful, right? Out of here, I hope that y'all are leaving, going back in at five o'clock with more joy, right? Uh, and more grace. So thank you all. We'll make sure to share contact information, right? To make sure that we're taking things from this chat so you all feel resourced up. Okay.